is undesired and alone Always on the outside looking in Empty handed souls with no right to
Welcome, dear children who woke up this morning with excitement and expectation, ready to receive the good gift that God is offering, wrapped in the mercies of today. Welcome, children who are hesitant and skeptical, self-protecting because of the pain you have endured. Welcome, children who are delighting in the company of so many other sisters and brothers in Christ. Welcome, children who long for a quiet place where you can be alone with your Heavenly Father. Welcome, children who know God's absence more keenly than God's presence. Welcome, precious children who give love freely and without restraint. Welcome, precious children who struggle to receive the embrace of your divine parents. Hear the voice of Jesus today as he says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belong the kingdom of heaven. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Growing up in the Dominican Republic, I learned the value of greeting one another as we come to worship. As Dominicans, when we come to worship, we spend quite a lot of time just greeting one another. It's not before the service or after the service. It is part of the worship. To be loved and to love. And Dominican style greeting may be very different than how you do it in the Midwest. I'm not really sure. But you tell me. So when we greet one another, as men, when we greet one another, we give a handshake, we pull into a hug, and come back to a handshake. So handshake, hug, handshake. All right? Men, when we greet women... And women, when you greet women, it's the same thing. Men, we extend our hand. Oh, men. We'll do men first. Here we go. Men. Head, handshake, hug, handshake. Now, Jewu and Nikki will demonstrate Dominican greeting. Men to women and also women to women. No, that's not it. <laughs> So just a kiss on the cheek. You're not actually kissing the cheek. You're touching your cheek to the other person's cheek and kissing the air next to the cheek. So <laughs> if that makes you feel any better, I'd like to invite you to stand and greet three or four people Dominican style this morning. Somebody today, the Lord will bless someone today. The Lord will bless some people today. The Lord will bless somebody. Oh, the Lord, the Lord will bless someone today. Somebody today. Some people today, the Lord will bless someone today. The Lord will bless somebody for oh, the Lord. The Lord will bless someone today. Somebody today. The Lord will bless someone today. Oh, the Maybe some 
somebody. The Lord will bless somebody today. The Lord will bless some people today. The Lord will bless somebody. Oh, the Lord. The Lord bless Are you ready? Today. The Lord will bless someone today. Oh, the Lord. The Lord will bless somebody today. be alive today. Yes. You can't say no to that. <laughs> it is good to be alive. Just feel the breath in your body this morning. Mm. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It is a miracle that we are alive this morning, isn't it? You're breathing on your own. You're thinking on your own. You get another chance to experience who Jesus is. Thank you, God. I'm out of breath. Anyone else? Yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect time. We're going to teach you a song this morning that is in three different languages, in English, in Spanish, and Korean. And so, if uh, you haven't sung any of these languages before, I wish I could say that about English. If you haven't <laughs> sung one of these languages before, pick one this morning that might not be familiar to you. Get outside your comfort zone a little bit. So, here's how we're going to start it. I'm going to teach you the chorus in English, and then Josh is going to teach it in Spanish, and then Darin and... Joy over there in Korean. Pick your language this morning, okay? I'm Nikki, by the way. Okay, so uh, Joy, thanks. So the chorus goes like this. We wash Let's try it together. We worship. Good, I hear you, basses. We bow down. Good. We worship. Three in one. Good. Now, here's how it sounds in Spanish. We worship. Thank you. 
language and let's sing it out together. Let's try it. Here we go.
can have a seat. My name is Abraham Ding. I was born and raised in um, South Sudan and Sudan together. And my dad have 12 wives. My grandfather has 75, so it's kind of in the, in the family blood. And because of that, we are so many as brothers and sisters. I was counting the other day, what I can count is 12 brothers and 20 plus sisters. And because of that, my dad, when he want to send somebody, he can recall all our name together, even though he's the one who gave us the name. And my name, I thought, was very special to my dad because it should be my grandfather, which is my father, dad. But he didn't even remember that. So when he want to send somebody, he just yell out, hey! And whoever say, yes, you better come. And you come and you stand before him. He look at you like, who are you? <laughs> He'd be like, I'm Abraham. Uh, and okay, who was your mother? Uh, my mother, so and so. Okay, were you the first, the second, or the third, or the fifth? Putting all this information together, those of IT know, then the outcome come, the DNA is done, you are my son. Growing up, that hurt me, that even my father don't know my name. And I tried to do many other things to catch his attention, becoming a very standout student in the school, and didn't help become a troublemaker in the area. Every day they bring a complaint, Abraham beat this, Abraham did this, but that doesn't help for my dad to remember my name. Forget that I look like him. That all didn't help. I iron his clothes, that doesn't help to recall my name. Until the day I came to know Christ as my personal savior, April 19, 1991. And then I come to learn that God is my father. Not only he is my father, I didn't accept that. But what made me cling to God as my father because he knows my name. Among all these children, he knows my name. And even he knows the number of the hair in my head. Now wait a second. I know how many hairs you have on your head. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I see them. Or I don't see them. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you don't stand, but, but, but God know the numbers of them. <laughs> so this song we're going to sing in, in Arabic, we say, Baba al Fisama, God or my father who is in heaven. Mafitan is the inter, there's no one or there's no other one like you. It had a special meaning to me because he's a father who knows my name, not just God. So I'm going to teach you how to say it in Arabic and then my sister Sylvie will teach us to say it in Swahili. So say with me, Baba Alfisama. Baba Alfisama. Mafi Tani Zeinta. Mafi Tani Zeinta. There's no other one like you. So I don't know how many of you today have ex the same experience with, like I do. If you do, we have a father. Who knows our name? Sister Sylvie? Baba Wambinguni. Baba, Baba Wambinguni. Akuna Kamawewe. Akuna Kamawewe. And if you watch Lion King, Hakuna, ring a bell with you. Hakuna Matata. Baba Alfisama. Mafitani Zainta Baba Alfisama Mafitani Zainta Let me hear Sing one more time Baba You can sing it louder than that, Baba Fisama. Baba. Thank you. 
Baba Al-Fisaba is in Juba, Arabic, in South Sudan. In case you will wonder what you just sang.
Abraham talked about uh, his relationship with his earthly father being a little complicated. And for others of us, we have uh, relationships with our mother that can be a little complicated. Whether your mother is still living or your mother has since passed, the relationship oftentimes can be a little complicated. <laughs> for those of you who have uh, lived uh, even the slightest bit of life without your mother, without your earthly mother, uh, know that God sees you. And no matter how complicated the relationship is or was, uh, the love that you have or had for her, the love that she gave uh, or gives to you, that God sees you. Uh, my mother has now been gone dead for about 20 years. Uh, most amazing person I've ever met in my life. Uh, she died when I was 21, so, uh, which is weird since I'm 23. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, I can't see you all, it's driving me crazy. Um, so, uh, yeah, my mom died when I was 21, and uh, most amazing person, most significant relationship in my life, and yet God has still been present more than anything else. He showed me that he is the great pursuer of my life. And so for you all today, no matter how complicated your relationship is or has been or was with your earthly mother, just know that God sees you. And do not resist the provisions that God brings into your life of other people who don't substitute, but they are beautiful companions along the journey that are there given to you by God so that you can keep making it because you can't make it by yourself. So just receive that today and know that God sees you no matter where you are. This song goes like this. Sometimes I feel like a mother. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. So.
from home. I'm known as the person who cry only once a year, and I'm crying right now. Thank you, Nikki. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the reading of Orphan's Creed. I believe in Almighty God, the Father of all, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. God is the Father of lies, who gives good gifts to his children and does not change like shifting shadows. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. He is the firstborn among many sisters and brothers and sets the examples for us so that we might know how to live in this world as beloved children of God. I believe in the Holy Spirit who comforts and encourages us it is because we are born of the Spirit that we are able to enter into the kingdom of God. I believe that the church is the family of God, a family in which each child belongs and is welcomed at God's table, surrounded by love and nourished by grace. I believe that we must extend to the same welcome, the same acceptance, the same forgiveness that we have received from God. I believe that in the resurrection, we who are from every tribe, language, and nation will be together forever in complete unity and diversity. I believe there is a place prepared for us in God's house where we will dwell together with God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. If you're willing, would you just turn to your neighbor and encourage them? Say, there's a place for you in God's house, at God's table. Just speak that over one another. <clears throat> what happens? What happens when... Syrians and Chin Burmese and white Americans and Koreans really believe that they are one family? What happens when they get together and write a song together after meditating on Ephesians chapter 4? There is one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The result for us in our community was this next song that we want to share with you. The words in Arabic come straight from scripture, Ephesians 4. There is one Lord, there's one God. You might see the word Allah there. That's the word Christians use to refer to God, as well as Muslims. One Lord, one God, in all, through all. Al-kul fil kul. So we'll teach you how to sing this in Arabic, and then we'll invite you to sing it with us. And then you'll notice that we don't just stay in Arabic. We'll move around to a few different languages. So follow us as you can.
different gifts and means to serve. There are different gifts, different means to serve, but the same God, yes, the same God. There are different ways that the Spirit works, yes, the same God, yes, the same God. Aruhwahed. I think you're getting it. Let's sing it one more time together. Sing it out with Nikki. There are different gifts. There are different gifts, different means to serve, but the same God. Yes, the same God. There are different ways that the Spirit works, but the same God. Yes, the same there are different God. gifts. There are different, different gifts, different needs to serve. But the same God, yes, the same God. There are different ways that the Spirit works. But the same God, yes, the same God. For the good of all, for the good of all. Holy Spirit gives good gifts to us for the good of all, for the good of all. The Holy Spirit gives good gifts to us for the good of all, for the good of all. I'm going to read Psalm 131, uh, 33, uh, the first verse in Arabic. Huwada ma ajmal wa ma ahsan an yaskun al ikhwa ma'an. I'll be reading Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 in Korean. 그러므로 주 안에서 갇힌 내가 너희를 권하노니 너희가 부르심을 받은 일에 합당하게 행하여 모든 겸손과 온유로 하고 오래 참음으로 사랑 가운데서 서로 용납하고 평안에 매는 줄로 성령이 하나 되게 하신 것을 힘써 지키라. I'll be reading Galatians 3 verses 26 to 28 in French. Car vous êtes tous fils de Dieu par la foi en Jésus-Christ. Vous tous qui avez été baptisés en Jésus-Christ, vous avez été revêtus en Christ. Il n'y a plus ni juif ni grec, il n'y a plus ni esclave ni libre, il n'y a plus ni homme ni femme, car tous vous êtes un en Jésus-Christ. 
I'm grateful for the word of God. We're going to read um, and engage in a prayer of confession together. And if this isn't part of your tradition and it's new to you, all we'll do is you all will begin and sing. Uh, sing. You can sing it if you want. You can speak <laughs> the words that are in bold. And then I will lead us where it says leader. And let's read it together like, um, like we mean it. Okay? So you all begin and I'll follow. We confess. Here we go. We, we confess, confess to you, generous, generous God, God, that, that we, we struggle, struggle to receive what you, what you offer us. We hurry past your love. We often treat ourselves with condemnation and even contempt. We, we confess, confess to you, living God, our, our failure to live as beloved children. We confess to you, loving God, that we have not loved as you have loved us. We confess to you, gracious God, our failure to live in harmony as sisters and brothers. We have failed to maintain the spirit of unity that you have given us. We confess to you, sovereign God, that we have not acknowledged you as over all and through all and in all. Our lips have prayed, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but our lives have spoken otherwise. Lord, Lord have, have mercy, mercy on us. And now I invite you into a moment of silence. I invite you to listen for the invitation of God to live as beloved children and to imagine what would it look like for you to live fully as a beloved child of God. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, as we open your word, we ask that you also open our hearts and minds so that we may hear your voice and obey. In Christ's name, amen. The scripture reading today comes from Hosea chapter 11, 1 through 11. Please listen as I read and follow along. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks, I bent down and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to re return to me. The sore rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me, 
To the Most High they call, but He does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal. The Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from the Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Let's be to God. Have you ever wondered what divine divine soliloquy sounds like? What is the inner life of God like? What does God's self-talk sound like? What are the thoughts, affections, intentions of a holy God who has no counterpart? Of course, as human beings, we can't fully comprehend God and we can't fully grasp God's wisdom. Nonetheless, I think this precious text before us gives us a small window into God's inner life and more pertinently, God's heart for us. So, what do we hear in this divine soliloquy before us? I wonder if you can hear God's tender care for his children that we shouldn't forget. When Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt, I called my son, God says in verse 1. A holy God who is perfect in every way, knows no lack, loved Israel out of the overflow of his heart. Israel, the people who were mistreated ruthlessly, struck down, stripped of their dignity, rights, and freedom by the oppression and slavery of Pharaoh. Israel that was afflicted with heavy burdens, building cities for Pharaoh that they can't call home, and working in the fields in the harvest which their children can't partake. Israel who was trying to survive each day with no dream, hope, or purpose, or direction, because their reality was too painful, too all-consuming. Israel, who had nothing to offer God and had nothing to trade in for God's favor. With this Israel, that was as weak and as powerless as a young child, God initiated a relationship, and he loved them dearly. Like a compassionate parent who hears a child's painful cry and adopts the child in need, God, without any condition or obligation, chose Israel and rescued Israel out of their dark, lonely existence in Egypt. It was God who did this. It was God who used an unimaginable leader, Moses, a stuttering 80-year-old shepherd, an ex-prince of Egypt, a murderer, a fugitive wanted for his crime, a forgotten man as his servant to rescue Israel from the mightiest nation in the ancient world. It was God who filled Moses' trembling mouth with these words to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go so that he may worship me. It was God who enabled Moses to perform signs and miracles before Pharaoh's magicians and advisors. It was God who reassured Israel of the promise to deliver them when things appeared bleak. And it was God again who brought on a series of plagues that demonstrated his unparalleled power over the false gods of Egypt. And it was God who finally and triumphantly cast more than 600 Egyptian chariots into the Red Sea so that his people could cross the sea on dry land and be freed. It was God and no one else who cared for and loved Israel and delivered them out of the darkness and bondage of Egypt. But even after Israel left Egypt, Israel did not shed Egypt. Egypt had seeped deep into their bones. Israel had been long exposed to the belief in false gods and the pagan practices of Egypt. And now, God had to instruct them to walk with him. 
The ex-slaves had been shaped to the core by a hurried, cutthroat life driven by fear of scarcity and punishment. To these slaves, God had to teach them little by little and step by step how to live in peace and freedom in trusting that God's grace and provision are abundant and will never run out. Like a caring father who is intimately involved in every development and a moment in a child's life, it was God who taught Israel to walk as his free people by tenderly taking them up by into his arms. Sure, there were good days and there were bad days. But even when Israel stumbled and fell, God, as the patient and nurturing parent, lifted Israel up, dusted them off, bandaged their wounds, and gave them the courage to take another step. God patiently guided his people to walk straight with cords of kindness and with bands of love rather than the whip of a harsh master. God's love for Israel is as scandalous as a Hebrew prophet who relentlessly loves and pursues an adulterous pagan wife. God's concern for Israel is as outrageous as a farmer who gets down to serve food to a weary animal, even removing its yoke so that it can eat freely and even savor the abundance of the farmer's provision and care. This is the extravagant care that God had shown Israel. And isn't this the same care and love that God has shown us too? Are we not here today because God has been good and faithful to each one of us? When there was nothing good or pure in us, God loved us first, called us by our name, and told us, that we are his. God holds the universe together, and yet his eyes are on us. His ears are attentive to even our sighs, and his heart is set on us. Think back to all the times God heard your cry, carried your burdens, saved your day, guided your steps, satisfied your needs, picked you up, soothed your fears, walked with you from glory to glory until this moment. Whether we realize it or not, whether we re remember it or not, all of us are here today because we are fiercely loved, overwhelmingly cared for, clothed, healed, fed, protected, and preserved by God in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. Yet the great tragedy in this passage is that Israel did forget God and God's tender care for them. And if we're honest, too often, we forget to. In this passage, do you hear, do you really hear God's grievance against his children that we shouldn't dismiss? God says in verses 2 and 3, The more I called Israel, the more they went away from me. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. In this divine soliloquy, we hear that Israel forgot and betrayed God. Their actions were not incidental. Rather, they were conscious choices to repeatedly deny God. But the God who called Israel out of Egypt in an amazing way repeatedly called out to the prodigal Israel through the prophets. God reminded them of his care and love for them, warned them about the consequences of their choices and actions that betray God. God comforted them in their fears and troubles and urged them to return to him where they are safe and can best flourish. But the more God called them, they spurned God and turned their backs on him. Here in our passage, we hear God addressing the northern kingdom of Israel that was consumed with idols, in particular with the worship of Baal. Israel believed that Baal, the weather god, had power over rain, lightning, and wind, and thus could make them give them a fertile land for maximum agricultural productivity. And rather than relying on Yahweh, the creator of the universe, the one true God, Israel broke their covenantal union with God by giving their heart away to Baal, by worshiping and sacrificing to it. 
People went as far to have ritual sexual relations with the shrine prostitutes. This expresses the wrath of God. <laughs> People went as far to have ritual sexual relations with the, the shrine prostitutes, believing that this would earn Baal's blessing, provision, and protection. And as if this wasn't enough, Israel's other sins are cataloged by God in an earlier chapter. Swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. He says they break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. In fact, Israel's state was so bad that God declared there is no faithfulness or steadfast love and loyalty and no knowledge of God in this land. Do you hear the devastation? These are shocking things, and things don't look too good for Israel at all. But I would say perhaps Israel's greatest sin was not returning to God who was calling them back. Israel acted like an ungrateful, insolent child who renounced the parent who raised them, turned a deaf ear to the parent's voice, and stubbornly refused to take the parental warning seriously. God warns the disobedient Israel in our passage that there will be consequence for their stubborn choice to not return to God. Ironically, they will be forced to return instead to their former state in Egypt, being oppressed by a merciless human king. Only this time, it won't be Egypt that oppresses them, it will be Assyria. Violence, war, military siege, strife, invasion, and the fall of the northern kingdom by Assyrians all lay in Israel's immediate future because they failed to remember God as their true king and refused to go back to God. And because Israel is, being, is so bent on uh, turning away from God, God will not be their help when they call out to him from their lips, but not their hearts. I wasn't asking for this for dramatic effects, by the way. <laughs> but before we wave our fingers disapprovingly at Israel, and we miss God's voice speaking to us also, let's also ask ourselves, how about us? Can you hear God speaking out against our ingratitude and contemptuous words and speech that insult and betray God? We're gathered here today because we say we want to learn about worship and what it means to truly adore God as if that's the only thing that really matters to us. But we have to ask ourselves, are we really living every day as true worshipers who honor God for who God is and what God has done for us? After all, doesn't worship begin by beholding God and remembering what God has done for us? Well, I don't know about you, but I fail at this more than I want to admit. God is attentive to my needs, patient with my slowness, and cares about my fears and anxieties. But I often find myself grieving God with my words and actions, doing things my way, bending my knees to idols that I trust and worship more than God. How about you? What are your idols? What are you relying on today? What do you worship for your safety, security, and provision? And to what have you given your heart and body? Maybe we've become too numb to our own sins and waywardness. We tend to dismiss our sins and justify our complacency. And we say that the problem is actually my church. It's the world's fault. It's the state of this nation that makes me this way. But if we want our worship to be genuine and renewed, maybe we need to honestly face our own spiritual and physical idolatry that God sees in us, even if we deny it. No running away, no excuses. Our sins and excuse, uh, uh, weaknesses can overwhelm us. And these things can make us feel powerless and hopeless. We may fool people around us, but we know the truth about who we really are and what we're really like. 
And when faced with the ugly truth of our sins and brokenness, we can't help but wonder, will our failures characterize our lives? Will our sins and shortcomings define us? Is there a future for us? Does God still love us? But I wonder if we might be able to hear just one more thing in this text that gives us hope this morning. Do you hear God's persistent love for his children that we shouldn't take for granted? Although Israel grieved and angered God by sinning and refusing to turn back to God, God is tenacious and resolved to love and restore his children. God says in verse 8, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? In breaking the covenant and renouncing God through their words and actions, Israel deserved total destruction. Like the famous cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, or the lesser known city, neighboring cities like Adma and Zeboim, that were also overthrown by God for their stiff-necked arrogance, indifference, and detestable sins, Israel deserved death and ruin for their wickedness. In their callousness, Israel may have believed that they were different from those pagan nations around them and that even if God's judgment comes, they were safe actually because they weren't like those people, those neighboring nations. What they didn't realize, however, was that they weren't that different. They also deserved God's wrath and punishment. Yet amazingly, The covenantal God cannot suppress his compassion and love for his children and exclaims in verses 8 and 9, How can I make you like Adma in its desolation? How can I treat you like Zeboim in its destruction? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. God chooses to overturn his heart rather than overturn Israel that refuses to turn back to God. What an amazing God that is unlike anything or any being that we know. God is holy and he's unlike us who don't know how to sustain both justice and love at once, especially when we're offended. God is like no other because he's not swept away by his passions and burst out in fits of anger toward his creation. God is perfect, and his love is perfect, and there is no change of, de- of de- degree of change in him or in his love, which would suggest something less than perfection. God is determined not to give up on his wayward children and instead to be in their midst as their God, no matter where they go or whatever they go through as a result of their actions. The holy God wants to be in our messy lives, even in the midst of the messes that we create for ourselves. Do you hear this remarkable, persistent love of the divine parent that we shouldn't take for granted this morning? In fact, what's amazing is that God's desire to be with us is a prominent theme that runs from the very first page of the Bible to its final page. God's determination to reach us, uh, to, to be with us, reaches a pinnacle in the person of Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. And by the time Jesus was born, the northern kingdom of Israel had long passed away, and even the remaining southern kingdom of Judah had eventually fallen to the hands of Babylonians. Other empires rose and fell, vying for power in the centuries that followed, and by Jesus' time, Rome had risen as the new superpower. Times had changed, and so did culture. But the world that Jesus was born into was strikingly similar to the world that Hosea lived in and ministered to many generations before. The Apostle John sketches the world's response to Jesus' arrival this way. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. Hosea lived and prophesied to obstinate people who did not really know God, even though they knew of him. Jesus, who was born into a world that also did not recognize or know its creator, light, and redeemer, was born into the similar world. 
Sounds pretty similar to our world too, doesn't it? And yet this is not how things end, thanks be to God. If we know anything about God, it's that God's story always has an unexpected twist. The end is, ending is always a surprise turn of events that flip the conflict on its head. In the prologue of his God, a gospel account, John goes on to say, but to all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Here, John is announcing that the persistent God who longs to be with his wayward children has taken on human flesh and come to live with us. We're not left to our blindness or ignorance in a dark world. The persistent God broke into our world and our lives through the layers of our pretensions, sins, and hopelessness to be with us and to give us life. And John gives a living witness to the fulfillment of God's resolve in his old promise to redeem his children that Hosea prophesizes in this text. Our passage, which tells Israel's story, has the most unexpected ending in verse 9, excuse me, verse 10 and 11. Hear this. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. In the conclusion to our text, we hear God saying that Israel will suffer dispersion and exile in Assyria and other distant lands like Egypt for a time because of their choices and actions. However, even in those moments, God will be with his people and preserve Israel through a remnant. God will not forget or abandon them as they deserve, but in his time, he will call and gather his dispersed children who are as helpless as cubs and birds and resettle them in their homes. They will return from exile. And not only that, there is a sense in which these verses point beyond Israel's physical return from the exile to their spiritual homecoming, a, second, a mass second exodus from their oppression and bondage. And this is the restoration and the newness that the Messiah will bring that this passage looks forward to. Hope is not what I would have imagined as a fitting ending to this passage, and yet that's exactly what we get here. God will accomplish these things through the Messiah, Jesus Christ, his perfect, obedient son who pleases the Father. Whereas the children of Israel fail to truly know the Father and to please him, Jesus, who comes in the lineage of King David and represents the true Israel, will live a perfect life that's after the Father's own heart. And though, uh, through Jesus' death and resurrection, he will redeem and gather Israel and the nations of the world into the Father's arms. God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, but they failed to live a new life that honor the Father's care and tender care and love for them. But Jesus who according to the gospel writer Matthew fulfills the prophecy, out of Egypt I called my son, is the true Israel that will not bow down to any idol, but only love God with his whole being. And out of his love and zeal for the Father's glory, Jesus, the obedient son, will empty himself and die on the cross to save the Father's wayward children. And it is only through the redemptive work of Jesus that the wayward children like you and me can be called the holy people of God, the church, ecclesia, the called out ones. This is the unfathomable pro promise of hope and restoration that God gives the undeserving Israel and that God extends to his people, you and me today. What do you hear in the text before us? Do you hear God's kind, tender care for us that we mustn't forget? Do you hear God's grievance against our ungrateful insolence that shouldn't be dismissed? Do you hear God's persistent love for us that we shouldn't take for granted? I pray that we do. Oh, children of God, hear God's voice today. 
and let us turn back to the holy God who can't be compared to any other being or, or any other uh, thing in the universe. Amen. One more time before we leave this place this morning, let us declare the reality that we are children of God, sons and daughters, and let us not fail to give thanks. We're going to teach you a little song in Sudanese Arabic that com combines with a song in English that you may already know. The Arabic simply says, we are all children of God and we gather to thank God, to thank Jesus, to thank the Messiah. So let us stand together. If you know this, sing it out with grace. The love he lavished on us, he called the children of the King. And in his love and kindness, he chose the lowly and the weak And his heart is good He is always kind With the cross he proved He is all our side. We are the sons and daughters of God We are the sons, we are the daughters of God Let's lift our voices together. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the lost, He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. One more time, we are the sons, we are the daughters of God. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, no matter where we go, we cross to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, and though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the lost, and He will never forsake. Oh, <laughs> 
ಅಲ್ಲ ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ರಾಬೋನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಅಲ್ಲ ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಯಸು ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಅಲ್ಲ ಶುಕುರು ಯಸು ಅಲ್ ಮೆಸಿಯಾ ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಅಲ್ಲ ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಯಸು ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಅಲ್ಲ ಶುಕುರು ಯಸು ಅಲ್ ಮೆಸಿಯಾ ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಅಲ್ಲ ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಯಸು ನಿನಾಲೆಮು ಶುಕುರು ಅಲ್ಲ ಶುಕುರು ಯಸು ಅಲ್ receive the lord's blessing as children of god god go before you to guide you god go behind you to protect you god go beneath you to support you and god go beside you to befriend you and be not afraid Let the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, settle in around you, and make its home in you. Be not afraid, and know your Father's peace. Amen.